So I'm honored to be here today with Marty Janowitz, an old friend, uh, both of Naropa. You've been involved in Naropa since, uh, for a couple of years. Since it was a puppy and I was a teeny weeny puppy. Since you were 23 or something? 23, yeah. Yeah. And um, I guess being at Naropa and uh, being in the lineage uh, of Trunk Brimshay, his calligraphy right here and photo right there, we could begin with a bow of respect. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Marty. So, I guess on this day, the commencement day at Naropa, how do, how do you feel about where Naropa is at, given it's been around for 40 years now, no longer such a puppy? Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, Naropa's kind of in its uh, teenagerism mm -hmm. right now, uh, which means there's a, a lot of uh, maturity, but it's still rambunctious, mm -hmm. and uh, so many things need to be done and so much more possibilities of... Uh, so of, much work. So much work, and, but I think more in terms of so many areas in Europa could move into the things it was right. intended to do. Right. So many connections to make with the uh, outside connections. world. And yeah, you know, I, I thought uh, from the very beginning that uh, Trungpa Rinpoche's idea was for Naropa to be a kind of node of impact. Uh, uh -huh. and, and that impact is you know, internal in terms of the experience of the students, but I think the bigger impact is the ripple impact both from the graduates and from the faculty and from the ways uh, Naropa can be a kind of activist convener of things that happen mm. and conversations that need to happen. Mm. So for people who don't know, what is Naropa's history, which is very unique, and what is it today? The, the, the shortest version of the story, Waylon, that I can come up with is that uh, Trungpa Rinpoche, of course, came from Tibet to North America. A uh, Tibetan Buddhist teacher. Tibetan Buddhist teacher uh, and somebody who just let go of the traditional constraints and then applied those traditional learnings in an untraditional way to suit the moment. So he was in North America. He saw the power of American education and also the, the gap. And he saw the power in Tibetan traditional education and the gap. And he the said... The gap meaning like what was missing. Well, things that were missing, things yeah. that it was not able to accomplish or ways in which each of them are myopic. Uh -huh. And he, he had this sense that, uh, as he said, bring East and West together and sparks will fly. Mm -hmm. You know, something will happen which is alchemic and different and better, more interesting, more profound, more powerful than what was happening with the two separate streams. So here students can meditate, they can study writing, they can study psychology. How, how does Naropa bring those two traditions together? The, 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 fu the fundamental thing since the very beginning was that meditative practice or other genuine contemplative practices from mm. other genuine traditions, all tr traditions, are not only available to the students here, they are integrated into the curriculum. Mm. I mean, you meditate at Naropa, you get credit. Yeah. <laughs> Finally. <laughs> Finally. Or Tai Chi yeah. or tea or, you know, right. or Christian contemplative practice. You know, these things are, are in the program because they are meant to be elements in opening the environment of personal learning and openness to the world. So they're, they're not there just to fill the space. Mm -hmm. you know, they're there to activate the space. And then there's also teachings like with Jerry Colonna here on business or technology, how, how, yeah. in, how it can interact with the West. Well, the, the, the themes of education, you know, the programs yeah. at Naropa are based really on a couple of things. Yeah. One, coincidence, uh -huh. that initially Trungpa had people who were connecting to him, and they happened to be in certain spheres of action and study. So poetry, Allen Ginsberg, Ann Waldman, and William Burroughs-y types. Yeah. Uh, in psychology, Philip and Whalen. Philip Whalen. <laughs> Uh, anthropology, Gregory Bates, you know, whoever was at hand, what, whatever was in the society and intersecting with Naropa, right. Trungpa said, okay, let's Cage, go with that. John Cage. All of that kind yeah. of stuff. It was in, the, in the first few years, it was a hotbed of craziness, but also of things coming together. And you were here then? I was here. I was, uh, oddly enough, the first ever paid employee of Naropa. Wow. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, the, the, the oddity, it's just an that aside. That should be on your sash. Yeah, but, but the, really, the oddity is that I had just become an elementary school teacher, uh -huh. and I got a call out of the blue. I was already a student of Trungpa, 
and the call went something like, Rinpoche says you're interested in education. I said, yeah. He'd like to start a college. How about helping? <laughs> and so, poof, next thing you know, 73. It's very entrepreneurial. It was. And that's what I mean about the programs. They were entrepreneurial mm. in the intersection of available energy and what was going on in society. Mm. But then the other piece is that at Naropa, and I'm on, the, I'm on the board now, the faculty, staff, and board are always considering where's the need? Where is society moving? What, where are the fields at play? So now, for instance, we have a, a program in peace studies. Well, go figure, right? Uh, you know, there's a need. We, we are, art therapy came out of a recognition these are powerful tools. Mm. So we're, now we're exploring things as diverse as a business school. Mm -hmm. Imagine that, a Buddhist-inspired business school. But we think there's need and power, so that may come along. So right. that's how it goes. Yeah, mindfulness is on the cover of Time Magazine, Google, and everyone's checking out, you know, mindfulness is the buzzword of the year. Yeah, so and we're trying, to un need, we're yeah. trying to unbuzz it. Yeah. Because the, the, pro the problem is, yeah, when it's a buzzword, you know, it's yeah. kind of like a fly. Sure, it's a and, fad. And we're trying to say, how, you know, how do you get that meditative, contemplative piece working with you? Yeah. Uh, activating yeah. you, informing you, connecting you. Yeah. And that's part of, of the educational point of view here, has always been. And that's where the sparks come. You get this world of business that has tons of amazing energy, but very little, often very little mission well, you know, as, as, as Trungpa uh, said, uh, chaos is good news. Uh -huh. And so, you know, we are in a, you know, I don't want to say that pain and suffering are good news, right. but we're in, as have been, a time of all kinds of chaos and uncertainty and need. And that's, uh, that's a field at play. That's things that can and must be worked with. So let's go there. Let's work with those things. So given Naropa and this teenage status, where do you see, ironically, I guess, if it's a teenager, it would be going to college soon. <laughs> where do you yeah. see it going forward? Obviously, as you're saying, expanding into different areas, but as a college, what does Naropa want to be? I, I think there are a few things. One, for a period of time, we kind of let go of the steering wheel with regard to contemplative education. Mm -hmm. We were almost a bit embarrassed b right. by some of that. And, and other universities quite you know, wisely and I, and I think highly, you know, they, they moved more into it. But there's a little more in the sauce than just uh, mindfulness training. And we've put a lot of energy into reestablishing our focus on figuring out the power of that both within the university and beyond. We now have a center for contemplative education. We're looking at ways to get into things like business. Where the, you know, where's the power? How do we get involved? We're looking at more actively hosting conversations uh, around things that matter on a global level, on a national level. I mean, right now there's a lot going on in this campus uh, with regard to race, oppression, gender issues. They're an internal challenge. But we also recognize that that's a doorway into Naropa saying, okay, what do we have to say about this and what can we do to be part of the movement that needs to unfold so that there can be uh, progress in society? Hmm. So we'd like to see Naropa, I would love to see Naropa do more of what I think it was originally chartered to do, as it were, hmm. uh, which is to be a force for social change, personal change, and the power of the two coming together. And that's what, you know, that's what in Buddhist language we call creating enlightened societies. So how, that's, that's very inspiring. To, I mean, <laughs> given, given all the news about, you know, Baltimore, all the unrest, the racial unrest mm -hmm. around this country that is always there but has been manifesting in the news seemingly more and more in, over the last couple of years, how does, you know, we're in this relatively modestly sized university, how does um, this contemplative education practice of meditation, mindfulness, how can those intersect and be a benefit? Well, in a few ways, Waylon. Yeah. On the one hand, we have to ensure that what we're doing has benefit, that it works. Yeah. And so we're continually looking at how are our programs, how are our students doing? What are their lives like? Are we addressing their needs in a, we in a way that helps them mm -hmm. actually not only be stable and happy and healthy and able to address this world of uncertainty, but to find some path where they can apply that in what will be meaningful. Right. So that's very important. We, you know, we believe that if, if we're doing a good job there, we, if we can see that and our students can kind of report back, well then we have some ground to say we have something to say. 
We also feel that uh, if, if the Buddhist tradition has anything to offer, despite some problems, put it mildly, it's yeah. an attitude of non-bias. Uh -huh. uh, and to try to hold issues and to engage issues. We used to have Buddhist-Christian dialogues. Yeah. We've hosted some things in, in terms of Islam and Christianity and Buddhism, etc. You know, we, we need to say, okay, let us help or, or, or provide the opportunity, let's say, for some things that need to come together to come together mm -hmm. and to extend ourselves mm -hmm. and take some, some fair share of what responsibility we can. Sure. Well, that's inspiring. I, I love that your focus is you know, we just talked to Parker Palmer and it was a similar conversation in some ways. Whenever you talk about activism or being of service, you immediately connect that with, um, I mean, it sounds cliche, but sort of inner work or, mm -hmm. or focusing on the students. It's not just some ambition Europa has to be huge and to be out there, but focusing no. on the students as the vehicles in a way. Yeah, I mean, we, we would like to be huge and we would yeah. like to be out there, but uh, the question is always, what's the point? Right. And uh, right. For, you know, for us, the essential logic is that inner transformation is work, it's a journey, it's inextricably linked to social transformation. Uh, something came up at the board meeting the other day about, well, some of the things we've been hearing from students seem very inner focused, you know, very like me, me, me. And one of the board members wisely said, well, that's fine. You have to become more familiar with me. You need to develop a connection, a, a friendliness to me uh, before you can feel comfortable enough to listen beyond me. And that's, right. that's Buddhist path, but it's not sure. just Buddhist path. Yeah, and but without Maitri and the Buddhist tradition, we can't, we're just, like Trungpa Rinpoche would say, don't be, he said something about not being an activist until you've tamed or worked with your own aggression. Yeah, and, and that's been one of those uh, topics because I think the, the way I understand that is that you need to be connected with your own aggression. Uh -huh. If you wait to tame your aggression, right. uh, they're going to be activating your urn on the, yeah, exactly. on the mantelpiece. <laughs> but you know, but to, to appreciate yeah. that you can connect with your aggression, touch it, yeah. and occasionally let it go as an activist. Now, I am an activist in many ways. I work, as you know, in the sphere of environmental and sustainability issues. Some of the people I agree with most are least productive, least effective, because of the tremendous aggression they're holding. Hmm. Uh, and it, it's, it's sad and, and distressing when right. you see the aggression yeah. becomes the obstacle. And the aggression, which may be understandable, often creates further aggression from the opposition instead of, you know, the Abraham Lincoln quote, the way I defeat my enemies is I make them my friends. Yeah, that's a, a good analogy, and, and I, I like to distinguish between anger and aggression. Uh -huh. There are many things I am angry about. Uh -huh. you know, there, are many, there are many things that I feel uh -huh. our world is missing and, uh -huh. doing, and doing terrible things about. Right. But that's, that is a little different the than quote, being balled up yeah. in the aggression and becoming part of, okay, right. you know, I, I now hate the other. Right. And so, you know, right. yeah, let's be clear about what needs to change. And let's not, you know, not soft-pedal those things. I'm, I'm doing something next week, as, as I think you know, and I, I'm hesitant to mention it because it's one of those hoo-ha things. Well, I but, can say it. You're going to the White House. So why are you doing that? Uh, because it's, a, it's an opportunity that I did nothing to do with creating for Buddhist leaders to uh, meet at the White House and express uh, some things about how Buddhism, we think Buddhism might be in dialogue. We're offering two particular things, one on climate change, Hmm. and one on race relations. Hmm. But more generally, just engaging, now we're not going to meet anybody whose last name is Obama, as far as I know, mm -hmm. except maybe, um, what's the dog's name? If you want to in. Bo, we might meet. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, uh, but we're going to be in serious conversation, yeah. and, and uh, we'll see what happens. Well, fundamentally, I mean, the Buddhist practice of meditation is about dissolving our projections or our pre-judgment prejudice of our reality which is usually based on trying to figure out how to make myself happy and get away mm -hmm. suffering, right? And that seems to connect directly, I always think, with racism. I mean, if we can get past our prejudgments of others mm -hmm. and just engage in a raw, yes. often humorous way. Well, of course, light touch and humor is yeah. very often the only thing between us and complete obsession. Uh, uh, but, um, but the... Uh, 
Yeah, I mean, you, you've hit on the point. We, we have this twist that is very fundamental that is the separation. We, we think right. that there is separation between Us me and, and them, other. Yeah. Me and other, me and the space and you. We think that's yeah. three separate things. Yeah. Uh, well, it turns out there's not a whole lot of difference. It's just yeah. a, maybe a very slight fluctuation in the vibration or something, right? So, you know, the mindfulness practice is not a random thing to do. If you think mindfulness is about calming down, I'm not saying it doesn't, but just mm -hmm. as easily it can work you up. Uh, it's helping us see mm -hmm. the space that was always there. Now we're getting into, you know, maybe another thing, but the way I think of it is we go to the movies that we used to call the flicks, mm -hmm. right? Anybody who knew the old style flicks know that you're looking at the screen, it looks solid, mm -hmm. but it's actually a series of flickers. Right. But it's going by so quickly right, a that we jump, we jump yeah. to the conclusion that it's solid. Right. That's what's happening here. Flick, 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 and we jump to the conclusion that it's solid. But it's mostly when you examine it, you actually examine it. People say, why should I actually meditate? It's to examine that experientially. And you discover, as, as, um, as one of the, the lines from a sadhana, a practice that Rinpoche wrote goes, good or bad, Happy or sad, all thoughts vanish into emptiness, like the imprint of a bird in the sky. You gotta think about that. But it basically is, we discover the space only because we take the time to actually recognize the space, and that becomes the doorway to one, touching ourselves, mm -hmm. having some humor about it. It was like, man, that was pretty cute that I thought I was the solid thing. Right. Uh, and then in situations where I'm in some sort of thing with you and it's like solid right now, yeah. it could be a passionate thing, it could be an aggressive thing, it could be just a dull thing, whatever it is, right. it's a thing. And we think it's real, we think it's solid, we think it's happening. That's where you've know, you got to have your personal humor gerbil in your pocket uh -huh. that says, ego, ego. Uh -huh. <laughs> you know, that's pretty cute. Right. You don't have to fully buy into your passion, your aggression, your ignorance. You don't have to. Yeah. And even if you do, you can kind of say, oh, that's what I was doing, yeah. Right. What, what, you were a sun camper, right? Yeah. What does it say on those t-shirts? If you lose your mind. Come back. Yeah. And it doesn't, as I always love to say, it doesn't say don't lose your mind. As you just pointed out, no. we all lose our minds, then we have to. Yeah. Don't ask for the impossible. Right. We don't have to try and be perfect. And if you do encounter feelings of racism or ang aggression, or whatever it is, then you can recognize that, right? That's the fundamental yeah. practice of meditation and just come back. Yeah, my experience, such as it is, is that there's no version of reality, even so-called enlightened society, enlightened reality, not that I've been there, but there's no version where there are no thoughts, there are no emotions. It's the attachment, you know, it's, it's the buying into them as these, right. you know, these hard balls. That's the problem. Huh. Well, um, so final <laughs> question. I mean, what, do, what does the contemplative tradition uh, have to offer in terms of sustainability? Climate change seems to be one of those things in my worldview mm -hmm. that seems undefeatable and, you know, it's going to happen. It's already happening. How do you wake up in the morning and deal with a challenge like that? Well, it's, it's a big one, it's a tough one. It's, at this point, whether it's a solvable one, I really don't know. Right. Sometimes I say to myself, and this may be maudlin humor, that at the end of the day, um, it's not that the planet is at risk. Uh. It's that humans and species that share our narrow boundaries of life are in danger. Yeah. Cockroaches will do just fine, right. and evolution will go on from there. Uh, that's not a good thing. Yeah. Um, but um, talking about separation, climate change is the outcome of not only separation between me and other, but me and nature. Right. You know, thinking nature is yes. some sort of other right. that's there. It's like my personal human supermarket to supply my needs, right. you know, for me, myself, and I. And so the, that we can cut down the last forest. Like I'm just reading the New Yorker, they're cutting down the forest. Eighty percent of the forest elephants are gone in like two years, something mm -hmm. like that. Yeah, the the, the 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 litany of things that are going yeah. uh, going badly is just horrifying. Yeah. But the solution has got to be transformation in how we perceive the problem. Also, it has to be ingenuity and innovation. Also has to involve an, a, a willingness to relate to each other and to connect with nature. All of these things are, are part of it. Not giving up. Mm -hmm. uh, working, with Not things, giving up. working with things as they are. 
Yeah, I, I, um, I happen to have a great passion. It was a decision I made many years ago. Could have been health, could have been something else, but happened to be environment. And I ha say in some of the teachings I do, I do sometimes the workshops or retreats around what I call sacred activism, sure. which is how to bring an attitude of sacredness, which means normal connection. It's not like a, sacred is not a fancy thing, it's an ordinary thing. You know, appreciating things as they are is sacred. So a Buddhist uh, notion of sacred is appreciating things as they are. Yeah, they're good enough. Yeah, I mean, right. You know, that's sacred. That right. things are good enough. So we you're don't not have talking to... about a high holy brocade. No, we, we don't have to find some sort of other world right. in order to discover something worthy of our attention. We just have to work with things as they are. Can we bring an attitude of myself mm -hmm. as I am, others as they are, relationship, which we call mandala in environmental terms. We we call it ecosystem. Same thing, by the yeah. way. Yep. Can we bring an attitude yeah. of interrelationship, huh. or as Thich Nhat Hanh says, interbeing, into the activist world? In the sphere of, of climate, the sphere of health, the sphere of food, the sphere of whatever it is that's your passion for change. Mm. Can we bring an attitude of sacred participation? If we can do that, and by the way, sacred is also terribly funny mm. because of the foibles that are omnipresent. So. You know, it's, um, it's got to have uh, that touch of open to the, the dark and the light side simultaneously. So one world I struggle to imagine how one could engage in it in a sacred way is politics. So you're going to the White House. <laughs> well, there's like, politics, yes. Right, but <laughs> politics is a driver of so much change, positive and negative, in our world. It seems necessary to engage in it yeah. in some way. I mean, you're, what are your mm -hmm. thoughts in terms of not just going to the White House, but what could the White House, whoever the president is, do? How could, I mean, I guess my question is, can the world of politics with all the aggression, us versus them, be conquered or be tamed in, in some way? Yeah, anything's possible. I mean, it's, yeah. a, tough, it's a tough nut. I, I yeah. happen to live, as you know, in Canada. We are treated, thank you very much, America, to the US cable that's shoved our way. So when I'm really in a mood to be distressed, I flip back and forth between Fox News and MSNBC. Uh -huh. And it's kind of like, yeah. okay, you know, it's yeah. like the metronome of craziness. And, right. and, uh, <laughs> and, I, well said. Uh, and I realize that these are, these are solitudes that are not talking to each other. So right. we have to find a way to find the, not, not the common ground, because that's a theoretical construct, but the heart of common aspiration. I mean, what is it that is at the heart of aspiration? Now, I, in, where I live in little old Nova Scotia, I do a lot of this kind of stuff, and I figured out, talking to many people over many years, that the one thing Nova Scotians can agree on in their heart is they'd like Nova Scotia to be a place their children didn't have to leave yeah. in order to have their most rich and fulfilling life. Mm -hmm. Now, and that's something which, you know... It's fundamental. It's fundamental. And if we keep coming back and saying, well, let, let's remember what's fundamental. Yeah. Then we can say, let's figure out even a step on a path that moves us and we both can see the way there. That, that's not to diminish the power of difference and ideas. I mean, it is thorny in the extreme. Right. And people are so entrenched. And the money supporting it is absurdly, bizarrely... Yeah. A massive in the United States. Yeah. Um, yeah. That this is a, this is a big elephant. Yeah. No, no pun intended. Yeah, yeah. You're the right elephant, but yeah. the big elephant is spending five billion dollars to elect somebody next year. Yeah. Well, our name came from, among other sources, the same notion, which is the legend of the blind man and the elephant. Mm -hmm. You know that one. Yep. And if they, the notion is that they all think they're touching different parts of the elephant. They all think it's something different. One thinks it's a tree trunk. One thinks it's a you know, tiger because mm -hmm. they're touching the tusk. One yeah. thing it's a snake because they're touching the tail. But fundamentally, if they could see, they would. We're all talking about the same thing, yeah. which is we want our children, our grandchildren, to be happy and healthy. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I'll, I'll offer that what we're trying to do. Some of us is grab that elephant by the balls <laughs> and give it like a gigantic scream come yeah. out. So the elephant speaks for itself. Yeah. And no matter what you're touching, you go, oh, that's what I was touching. Right. Well, one of the blind men will probably make that mistake, and then they'll all learn <laughs> right. what they're touching. Well, I'm, I'm working at it. I'm, yeah. But, uh, not not well, so easily done. 
you're going to be touching <laughs> the elephant in uh, D.C. soon, so good yeah. luck. Well, we'll see what happens. Good. Well, Marty, thank you. All right, well, and I know this was last minute. Thank you for uh, getting me honor. in this room. Yeah. Well, and, and I'm going to say, so you, you know, you, you're a, what we call a Dharma brat, mm -hmm. and your, do, your father Probably. was what I call a Dharma rat, yeah. of the best type. I've known, <laughs> I've known him forever, yeah. and, and uh, um, if anybody's proud, I'm proud that the, the lineage can actually move through generations. Mm -hmm. Mm. Well, thank you. And it's, I mean, directly thanks to only a few of my uh, seniors, like Willie Riken, who you know, and uh, who Jeff Walter really cared to, yourself in the costume context, you cared to teach, you know, that lineage mm. is, uh, I think it's incumbent on gener older generations to... Well, yeah. You know one of my sons, and he's yeah. out there working for one of, I don't know if you call Vice a competitor, but uh, no, whatever they wish. are. But, uh, yeah, they're huge. Anyway. But yeah. Mm -hmm. Nathaniel. But he, did he wrote articles for you? Yeah, he's great. So. I just kind of reached out to him today. Good, good. Yeah. Well, if he sees this, there we go. All right, Marty, thank All right. you. Okay. Enjoy today.